Let me invite you, if you've entered the back of the room, to find a, a seat. I am not, as your program might have you think, Jason Witt. Jason is helping cover for me in a meeting and has not made it back. But on behalf of Jason Witt, faculty steward of the Honors Residential College, you have my greeting and welcome. We have for uh, now more than a decade been uh, pleased, honored indeed, to have this among our endowed lectures hosted in the Honors Residential College, of which Jason serves as our leader. Jason is a faculty member in the Honors Program, uh, dear to the students who make their home in the HRC, uh, both here in Alexander and across the, the way in Memorial Hall. And um, many of you will know him and appreciate uh, his leadership. So on Jason's behalf, greeting and welcome, and I will move seamlessly into introduction of our speaker. I know most of you, my name is Douglas Henry, I'm Dean of the Honors College. It, it's worth noting because the pandemic canceled so many gatherings that it is a gift, it is a blessing. Uh, it is worth reveling in the opportunity to gather ourselves, to rejoice in good company, and to enjoy conversation enriched by togetherness, proximity, personal exchange. Uh, we took these things long for granted, and um, I'm reminded regularly we should not. Today, our Christian intellectual life takes shape in welcoming a guest and listening with interest in learning and in joining our minds together in inquiry and deepened understanding. So thank you for the collegiate spirit your presence here today represents. Thanks as well to Max and Debbie Underwood uh, here uh, to my left, your right on the front row, for representing the family whose name is associated with this lecture. Debbie's mother, Manette, whose bio appears in your program, is dear to a great cloud of witnesses the world around whose lives have been shaped uh, by her influence, by her prayers, by her ministry, by her faith. And um, uh, that is applicable to many of us right here on Baylor's campus and to me personally as well. Uh, Manette's Christian grace and leadership and faith uh, were and are a blessing. And you honor us with your presence, Debbie and Max, thank you. Now, uh, my delight um, to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jessica Hooten Wilson. Dr. Wilson is visiting scholar of liberal arts at Pepperdine University, a post she took up this fall following service as Louise Cowan Scholar in Residence at the University of Dallas. She holds a BA in Creative Writing from Pepperdine, an MA in English from UD, and a PhD in Religion and Literature from Baylor. She was a U.S. Fulbright Grant recipient whose fellowship took her to the Czech Republic with teaching responsibilities at Charles University, one of the world's ancient universities with roots stretching back to the mid-1300s. They were just in time for the Black Death. Uh, and they survived remarkably and flourished. Dr. Wilson is a scholar whose thoughtful Christian life has been challenged and enriched by imaginative literature. She's the author of six books bearing just those marks, including Giving the Devil His Due, Demonic Authority, and the fiction of Flannery O'Connor and Fyodor Dostoevsky, which won Christianity Today's Award for Book of the Year in Arts and Culture. Another book, Walker Percy, Fyodor Dostoevsky, and the Search for Influence. Another title, Souls of Nietzsche in American Culture, The Russian Soul in the West. And most recently, The Scandal of Holiness, Renewing Your Imagination in the Company of Literary Saints. I've known Dr. Wilson since before she was a doctor, <laughs> and since her doctoral student days, when I began hearing words of praise about her from her mentors doing, during two years of teaching in her great text program. I watched her come into her own as a classroom teacher. She didn't have as far to come as I did at that stage of my career. And I heard from students of the ways in which her pedagogy and her mentoring, her advocacy, her insights, and her example inspired them. More recently, I've enjoyed working alongside her, more often watching her in consultative capacities for national organizations where her voice with conviction and wisdom is so urgently in need and also effective in her reading and praying and writing and teaching, including the education of her own children, Dr. Wilson seeks the Lord, the Logos who is the beginning and end of wisdom. Her keen mind and big heart and good words deserve our attention. Her talk is entitled, I think it's up here, 
the little way through the apocalypse, you'll notice a different title listed in your program, something to offend everyone. <laughs> the Tertium Quid and Walker Percy. You may have seen a poster around campus and come expecting that, something to offend everyone. If you came for that lecture, my hope is that you'll experience what Binks Bowling at the end of the movie goer says of the mystery of God's ways, that through some dim dazzling trick of grace, you came for the one lecture and receive another one as God's own importunate bonus. It's not a bad trick, is it? Instead of offense to everyone, to hear the little way through the apocalypse. Jessica, please come on up, knowing that we're eager to hear you, whether we're in for insult comedy or post-apocalyptic <laughs> redemption. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would like to begin with a prayer before I begin my talk. And I'm so humbled by that introduction, but I, I know I go but by the grace of God. And uh, nothing amazing is gonna happen in this room without the Lord's intercession. So this, this prayer is from Howard Thurman, who was a writer uh, in the 1930s. He wrote Jesus and the Disinherited a copy of which always went with Martin Luther King Jr. everywhere he went. He said it was more important in his luggage than his underwear. So it's an important book. And just to give you a small context for this prayer, when I was putting together my reader, Learning the Good Life, I was going to include one of these prayers because I enjoy praying this before classes. And his grandson called me. And his grandson said, you can use it, give the money to the church, I just want to make sure you're a faithful follower of Jesus if you're going to use this. And I thought, what amazing fruit that your faith was inherited in such a way that your grandchildren are still following and loving the Lord. And I just thought it was such a testament to who Thurman was. So I want to start with his prayer. It's called, Our Little Lives, Our Big Problems. These we place upon thy altar. And at the very end, it says, we say together this day. And so when I say that, if you would repeat that last line with me, our little lives, our big problems, these we, these we place at thy altar. So we'll pray that to start, and then I'll jump into some St. Therese and some Walker Percy. Our little lives, our big problems, these we place upon thy altar. The quietness in thy temple of silence again rebuffs us. For some, there is no discipline to hold them steady in the waiting, and the mind rejects the noiseless invasion of your spirit. For some, there is no will to offer what is central in the thoughts. The confusion is so manifest, there is no starting place to take hold. For some, the evils of the world tear down all concentration and scatter the focus of the high resolves. War and threat of war has covered us with heavy shadows, making the days big with forebodings, the nights crowded with frenzied dreams and restless churnings. We do not know to do what we know to do. We do not know how to be what we know to be. Our little lives are big problems. These we place upon your altar. So brood over our spirits, our Father. Blow upon whatever dream you have for us, that there may glow once again upon our hearths the light from thy altar. Pour upon us whatever our spirits need of shock, of lift, of release, that we might find strength for these days and courage and hope for tomorrow. In confidence we rest in God's sustaining grace, which makes possible triumph in defeat, gain in loss and love in hate. Together we say, our little lives our big problems, these we place on thy altar. Amen. It is such a great joy and delight to be in this place. I actually lived in this building when I was a graduate student working on my dissertation. I was getting to live with the faculty in residence, and so I'm so overjoyed to get to be here today. And the reason that I decided to move the talk this direction um, as much fun as it is to offend everybody. And, and by that, I mean I love the word scandal. I love that some things are offensive that turn us to God, right? It offends our sensibility that is too often comfortable, and it moves us towards a very uncomfortable faith, and God can do great things in that place. 
But right now, I feel like a lot of us have spent a lot of time being uncomfortable. And what I love about the little way is that it moves us back into this space that feels accessible. It feels like we can do this. And so I want to give us instead a great hope in St. Therese. But I want to start with Walker Percy. And the reason I'm starting with Walker Percy is because I think he shows us the world we're actually inhabiting right now. Love in the Ruins opens with now in these dread latter days of old USA and the Christ-haunted, Christ-forgetting, death-dealing Western world. I came to myself in a pine grove. And I wondered, has it happened at last? It opens with this apocalyptic scene in which we have a modern-day Dante, and he's holding on to a carbine on his lap, and he has his back up against a tree, and he's waiting for the bombs to fall. He's waiting for the world to end. He's waiting for everything to crash at his feet. It feels like he's losing. The good guys are losing, and the bad guys are winning, and everything is fractured and dismantled. He says, our beloved USA is in a bad way. Race against race, right against left. This is all from the novel. Heathen against believer, San Francisco against Los Angeles, Chicago against Cicero. And yet this world that he's writing about in 1971 feels so similar to where we are in 2022. In 1980, Rousey Wood, who was one of my mentors here, he said, In 1970s, this felt like a piece of zany hyperbole. But now, this just describes where we are. And Ralph writes that in 1980. How much more does it describe where we are today? Why does the world look so apocalyptic? Why does it look like it's falling apart? And if it's falling apart, how do we navigate? How do we travel through that apocalypse? Tom Moore as you can imagine his namesake is Sir Thomas More, who wants to bring about a utopia. Tom More is not our hero in this story. He's actually an anti-hero. He's a bad Catholic. He no longer believes in sacramental life. He no longer goes to church. He no longer takes the Eucharist. He's lost a daughter. He tried to commit suicide. He feels completely lost. And do you know where he turns for his answers? Science. He thinks maybe I can find a way out through my own abilities, through my own knowledge. Maybe, maybe my skills, my brain, my mind will lead us to a solution to all of our problems. So he creates something called, uh, and in Percy, everything is humorous, so you're, You can expect that this title of what he's creating is is quite funny. But he creates a quantitative, qualitative, ontological lapsometer, right? Um, Don't you love it when people use big words to hide the fact that nothing's actually happening? Okay, this is what Percy's doing. And he creates this, and what it is, it's a caliper of the soul. And it's going to make everyone happy. It's a qualitative, quantitative, ontological lapsometer. But the problem is that it doesn't actually make anybody happy. It just makes people feel happy. It's a way of treating the symptoms without getting to what's wrong in the soul. And Moore is convinced that he's going to be able to save the world this way. Right? He's going to bring about utopia that his namesake, Sir Thomas More, never brought about. And why is he doing this? Is he doing this for his love of people, the good of all humankind? He says, no, the the prayer of the scientist is actually, Lord, help me succeed in this for my fellow man. And failing that, Lord, don't let this cause too many problems. And failing that, Lord, help my article and brain get published before that destruction takes place. He admits, yeah, I believe in God and all the rest, but... I love women and music and science more, and I love my fellow man hardly at all. That's the order of things for Tom Moore when this book begins. So we're looking to a man who's going to save the world who doesn't actually care about any human person. He doesn't love his fellow man, but he's going to save humanity. 
and he himself is going to do it, right? This is a, a megalomania of the worst kind. And yet I find it profoundly relatable. And I think Percy did too. When Percy actually begins to write this novel, you have to remember where he came from. He was a scientist. He was an atheist originally. He um, believed that helping people as a doctor was gonna be the right way to go. And then he became sick with tuberculosis, which is gonna come back later because St. Therese actually dies of tuberculosis, right? So he becomes sick with tuberculosis, gets confined and has to go through quarantine. And then in the middle of this process, reads novels and they convert him to faith. Fiction brings him to God. So what does he decide to do with his newfound faith? He's going to make sure he writes fiction that brings other people to God. He's gonna proselytize through his fiction. And his first book is wildly successful. It's the moviegoer, right? It's a national book award winner. And nobody got that it had anything to do with Jesus. So in Percy's mind, this was a profound failure. And you might want to use earmuffs in a minute because I'm going to use his language. And he said, okay, my second novel is going to be an ass kicking for Jesus. Right? This is what I'm going to do. And he tries to make it, you know, this kind of epic, he really copies Dostoevsky's The Idiot, but he tries to make this epic story about coming to the Lord. And again, whoosh, over people's heads. So when he sets about writing this third novel, this is what he does. He writes his friend Shelby Foote, and he's like, I have a battle waging within me. I want to do the big one. I want to write Moby Dick. I want to write Don Quixote. I just keep thinking I can do bigger and bigger and bigger. I know I can. And yet, he says, that way leads to grandiosity of spirit, flatulence of the creative powers, <laughs> and perdition in general. These grand ambitions that Tom Moore suffers from are the same ambitions that Walker Percy suffers from. And what does he find to cure them so that he actually can write the novel that we have today? He says the answer is the little way of St. Therese. He says the answer is the little way. It's to treat of small things greatly. That's the answer through this ambition that I have. So what I want to do right now is I want to take a look at this grand panoramic, this epic novel that he sets before us. And then why does he say the way of St. Therese is how to wander through this? Because if you're anything like me, I think we all have this tension within us in which we're trying to understand how we were made for greatness but how that doesn't become a false dream that leads to flatulence of the creative powers and perdition in general, in which it gets misled to, I must have 100,000 followers and everyone should know my name, right? What, you know that musical Fame? You guys are probably too young. Hey, old friends in here, you guys remember that musical Fame, right? <laughs> so there's this, there's this false way of pursuing that. But then those grand ambitions, St. Therese says, God does not give us these desires unless they're going to be realizable. So she desires to be a saint. Is that not the grandest ambition of all? Is that not so much larger than Percy's ambition to write Moby Dick? How do we move from this desire to be great and amazing in such a way that it also fulfills God's kingdom call on our life? This is a big question, and it's one that I'm constantly dealing with myself. So I want to look to St. Therese, who's a new voice for me, and put her in conversation with Percy. I brought both of her books because I like visuals. Um, so if you're interested in the story of the soul, and then, of course, you should see my copy of Love in the Ruins, um, the, the pages and the note markers, like every good professor, it is multiple multiple markings, um, because I love this book, and I'm glad to get to share it with you. So let me, let me put them in conversation together. Moore's world is very different from St. Therese's. This is published in 1970, and St. Therese died in 1897. St. Therese is a Carmelite nun in France. Their worlds are, are separate, their worlds are apart from one another, and yet at the same time, what St. Therese experiences is her own version of apocalypse. The Carmelite order that she actually became a part of 
right before she had joined it, only 30, 40 years beforehand, had had a multiple number of the nuns marched off to their death and executed. So she's joining an order in which there's a risk of literally laying down your life to follow Jesus, right? She's, she's seeing this kind of religious persecution that feels apocalyptic in her own time and place. She dies in 1897, most people didn't know who she was, but she quickly becomes canonized. And when Walker Percy becomes a convert in 1947, there are new biographies very quickly afterwards coming out about her. Um, he owned two of them. In 1955, Father Etienne Robo puts out a biography called um, The Tr Two Portraits of St. Therese. And guess who reviews that copy? Flannery O'Connor, Walker Percy's friend. And Flannery O'Connor writes about St. Therese, this book particularly, and says, in this book we see a real saint, one in which her human greatness is understood. We get to have this portrait that makes sainthood accessible and not falsely coded or sugar, you know, sugary sentimentalized instead. The other one he owned was by John Beavers called The Storm of Glory. And then Dorothy Day, another one of his friends, was also writing a biography of St. Therese. So in the middle of the 1950s through 70s, we have a lot of American writers who feel like this international unrest, civil rights movement, lots of protesting, lots of division in their culture, that St. Therese is someone that they're actually turning to in the 50s through 70s. And they're looking at her portrait. She herself dies of tuberculosis at 24 years old. She lives a very unexciting life. Her world would not ever make a great film, right? It wouldn't make a great novel, even. And yet so many people turned to St. Therese. When she was dying, some of her last words, literally a month before she died, she said, I want you to share, she's telling this to her mother Prioress, I want you to share my little way with the world. And her mother Prioress asks her, what is your little way? And she says, my little way is absolute surrender to God. Absolute surrender to God. Now this is not, you know, a life altering manifesto. Um, it sounds very simple to us, and I think that's the entire point. But as Etienne Robo writes about St. Therese's way, this surrender is a disposition of the heart that makes one humble and little in the arms of God. We're conscious then of our weakness and trusting to the point of temerity in the kindness of our Father. To sum up, Teresa's little way was for ordinary people who could reach perfection by ordinary means because small acts of virtue are just as acceptable to God as great ones. Now when the apocalypse is looming, I think this little way removes that pride of thinking that we can fix everything, that we can change the world, that we can have these big solutions to what feel like very big problems right now. That we have to trust we can't fix the very big problems. What then can we do? How now shall we live? And what we see instead is a woman who accepted in her sickness, in her cloister, in her limitations, what it meant to follow God. She longed, just like I think Thomas More and just like Walker Percy, to be a big saint of renown. She actually longed to preach. She longed to be a priest. She wanted to give out the sacrament. She wanted to have a big role. She wanted to be a martyr like Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc at this time was just being beatified during the time that St. Therese was in her convent. So she sees this woman as this general who gets to be a saint for God. That sounds like an exciting way to be a saint. And yet she's dying of tuberculosis. She's not going to get to be Joan of Arc. What then does sanctity look like for her? Well, she takes these desires for bigness and greatness and surrenders them to the God who can actually do big things through her little life. That's what's beautiful, beautiful about St. Therese. Father Robo notes, by degrees she realized that the extraordinary ways of some saints, such as Joan of Arc, were not to be her way. Her holiness would be the reach of millions. It would be commonplace and uneventful, made up of obscure achievements, unimportant, unnoticed, and underappreciated. And St. Therese admits how much she was moved 
and longed to imitate Joan of Arc, and yet she said, I was made to understand the glory I would win would never be seen in my lifetime. And years later, someone like Hans von um, Balthasar actually described St. Therese as a spiritual warrior, that she's akin to Joan of Arc in that way, that she's a warrior, he says, even though her battles are fought for love, by means of love, for peace, by means of peace, the little flower's warlike qualities are bringing out these new aspects of her action in the midst of her contemplation. And just as no action can be more effective than that of contemplation, simply no battle can be more fierce or more final than the battle of love, which she conducts with the spirit. Unlike the science of Tom Moore, who relies on his own strength and his own mind and his own abilities, she said, I want to practice the science of love. That will be my vocation, she says. The science of love, the study and practice of really what is the most challenging a word that Percy says, we've worn the edges off the word of love the way somebody wears off the ridges off a poker chip. We don't understand how powerful that word is. We've heard over and over again, yes, love your neighbor as yourself, that we've forgotten what it actually means to love your neighbor as yourself. This practice of littleness that St. Therese is showing us prevents us from that pride of establishing utopia but it also prevents us from the fears that we might have about that oncoming apocalypse. I think one of the biggest problems I have in the church right now is this fear. And you see it all over. There's a fear that the church starts becoming self-preservationist. Don't hurt me. We're not gonna let them take us. We're not gonna let them take over. And if you notice, this action, is the exact opposite of this action. In the church, we're called to love looks like this. Wound me, hurt me, but also look at my openness. Look what you can receive, look what you can give, right? The position of the cross that St. Therese shows us what this looks like, this love is powerful, but yes, you're woundable, you're vulnerable, but that's the love you're being called to versus this love in which you're holding on to what you have. And it's the fear that makes us think about, well, what's next? What's in the future? What's going to happen? How can we prevent things? How can we solve things? And St. Therese says, I rarely think about the future because I'm enjoying my rest in the present in Christ. Well, it's an admirable idea. It's one that actually I think C.S. Lewis explores even more strongly through Wormwood. Do you remember the screw tape letters in which Wormwood is trying, he's a devil who's trying to counsel another devil, uh, or screw tape is counseling Wormwood, and he says, get him to focus on the future. Because it's the future that's abstract and unknowable, and therefore he then won't live in the concrete present, where he actually has to think about loving the person next to him if you can get him to think instead only about the future. Love in the Ruins closes with the apocalypse, maybe happening, maybe not, but it doesn't seem to matter. When all is said and done, the fallout has happened, we see Tom Moore five years later. Now, I'm, I'm summarizing a massive book <laughs> in a very short amount of time. Um, so I highly recommend you actually take the journey with Tom Moore. But what he starts with, he starts with on July 4th. The world is going to fall apart. Well, what world is going to fall apart if he's setting it on July 4th? The nation as he knows it, as he thinks it matters. There's a nationalism that begins the book that he is more concerned with. And you see this nationalism kind of unwind and unfold and get torn apart in many sense. But then the novel ends five years later on Christmas Eve. He's being transported towards a way of viewing things that is very myopic, towards a more expansive, eternal vision of the world that is set in the Christian calendar on Christmas Eve. And when you see Tom Moore by the end and he has this more expansive vision, you think, well, not much has changed for him. And he even says that. He says, when I look back on the past, in that last age, we planned projects and we cast ahead of ourselves and we listened to the minutes of the previous meeting and between times we took vacation. While I can't say things have changed much, what has changed is my way of dealing with it. 
So the apocalypse is still at the door at the end of it. Not much has changed for Tom Moore. But whether, I mean, I think we see this all the time, whether the barbarians are attacking St. Therese in France, whether they're attacking Augustine and the Roman Empire is following, you know, whether there's a whole wealth of trolls on Twitter, it's not going to ever go away, that apocalyptic sense. But instead, Moore has turned his attention towards seeing with God's eyes, towards seeing more expansively and fully really with a mind towards Kairos and seeing Kronos within that rather than the other way around. At the very end, one of my favorite scenes in the novel is when Moore returns to church. Uh, If you do read this book, if I can give you one more temptation to read it, in the very middle there is a a church celebrating uh, Property Rights Sunday. And Property Rights Sunday, they give an entire sermon about the necessity of white picket fence. And uh, they sing the Star Spangled Banner as the Eucharist is raised above their heads. (laughs) And that's the world of church that he was running from. But when the novel closes and it's Christmas Eve, he walks into confession. And he begins telling his priest, like, ah, I don't feel guilty for sin. You know, I'm still struggling. Things are still hard. And the priest has no time for such self-pitying discourse in his confessional. And the priest says, aren't there other things we must think about? Like doing our jobs, you being a better doctor, I being a better priest, showing a bit of ordinary kindness to people, particularly our own families. Unkindness to those close of us is such a pitiful thing. Aren't we supposed to be doing what we can for our poor, unhappy country? Things which, I mean, forgive me, but they seem more important than dwelling on a few middle-aged daydreams. And the words sound so harsh, but they do convict Tom Moore. And I think they convict him in two different ways. I think they convict him away from his pride, the ordinariness, the smallness, the beauty of those small, ordinary things that St. Therese was talking about. But also, notice how the priest says, please forgive me. Tom Moore gets to pretend to be a priest in some ways. He is the priesthood of all believers invited into this moment in which he gets to express forgiveness, and then he can also receive forgiveness. And there's this reciprocity of love of neighbor that he's been missing most of the novel that he gets to experience in the confession at the end. I think we see that movement for him away from the grandiosity of spirit that plagued him so much earlier. The way of spiritual childhood that St. Therese talks about might sound too simplistic. Unless you become like little children, I mean, who says things like that? Um, But I I think of my kids, and I think of how much I fail at being a mom, and how I can completely ruin a day. I, I, you know, I, I forgot so-and-so's lunch, or I yelled at the four-year-old, or whatever litany of sins you want to come up with. And then they end the day, and they say, you are the best mom in the whole world. (laughs) And I think that kind of love makes me want to look at the father and say, you are the best father in the whole world. That that kind of love of neighbor that can exist and be expressed, that small acts of sanctity are worth more than any of the big middle-aged daydreams we can come up with. When Pope Pius XI gave his homily when St. Therese was canonized, he said, if the way of spiritual childhood became the general way of being in the world, who does not see how easily it would reform all of the church? It looks trite, but isn't that what God has always done, uplifted the small? Dorothy Day in her biography says, God will give increase. At a time when there is such great fear, one can state that this saint is releasing a force that has more power than a cobalt bomb. So has it happened at last? I don't think that question is any longer about whether a bomb's gonna fall. Has it happened at last? Has spiritual power been released, one that looks small and ineffective, but has the power to spread goodness throughout the whole world. I hope so. May it be so. Thank you.
we have time for questions. Yeah. Yeah, I would love to take questions if people are interested in having a conversation. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Questions. I have to spoil a little bit more of Love in the Ruins. Oh, go for it. So yep. I'm sorry. Um, but the way it ends, he moves into the quarters. Mm -hmm. It's a former slave quarters, much more humble circumstances. Um, but I've always been haunted by the fact that the beginning of Thanatos Syndrome, which is the sequel, yeah. the quarters have been turned into a niche upper class real estate for artisans mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. wealthy landowners. Mm -hmm. So my question about the little way is, how do we keep the quarters from so turning good. into the suburbs? So good, absolutely. Well, and you know, what Percy is looking at is the Los Angelization of the world. That's what he talks about, right? He uses that phrase in which we make everything into tourism and kitsch, and um, we turn everything into exploitation. And I, th I think that's why you have to consider the little way. It doesn't mean everyone else is going to. That's the hard part, is that you know, we're gonna live in a world in which the rest of the body politic is not pursuing the little way. So it does require a great strength that doesn't come from us to be able to continue that because the things that you love are probably gonna get exploited. Um, we are going to have churches that we love become the church of Christian nationalism or whatever it's going to look like. The Los Angelization can continue happening, right? And, and in Thanatos Syndrome, you see him moving from the little way back to the little way, back to the little way. It's a continual process. And I think it's been a continual process throughout church history, and I think it's a continual process for all of us. I think one of the great lies um, that I believed for so long was I was waiting to get to college to then know what I was going to do. And nobody told me I would never know what I was doing. Right? That there would always be this regular of like, what am I supposed to be doing? How do I live? And it'd be in every single day, wait, should I be doing this today? Should I be doing this today? Um, so the little way is not a one and done. The little way is a constant, every single day uh, response, especially to the Los Angelization, which if we can prevent that, would be great. I say that from someone from Pepperdine, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a great question though. Other questions? Yes? Do you think it's possible to follow the, the little way and still have grand ambitions? Yes, I think, you know, I think that is a great question. This is what I've been trying to understand because I'm a very ambitious person, but I think I'm more in line with St. Therese's ambition, which means not following the worldly way of ambition. Right, um, so I, I do, I wanna be a saint, right? Like I have this, I, and, and I'm very aware of my imperfections and the impossibility of that and um, the difficulty of the reality of sin, right? Uh, but I think all of us feel these kinds of grand ambitions and if we don't surrender them to the God who can do the amazing things through us, then we create our own amazing things that are maybe doing good or maybe not. Right? So the, the frenetic fruitlessness that can happen when you don't first regard the contemplative life as the source for your action, that to me becomes the problem. Right? If the little way is not um, to treat these small things greatly, then we start treating these great things as though they matter a ton. And a lot of times those great things then are just puffing up ourselves and leading us to the wrong kinds of uses of our ambition. But I was having this conversation again with someone last night because I really, especially with students, I actually find not a desire for greatness. I find a lot more desire for like, because they wanna be humble, they don't wanna be great or they don't wanna excel. And I think we, and I'm definitely thinking through this, but I think we have to marry the two. I think if we explored magnanimity more, this idea that humility can lead to God to do great things through you is probably a good direction for those of us who've been stewarded talents and intellect and abilities to be able to do that. But it's a question that I'm not finalized on because I'm in process. <laughs> um, but it's a really important question. Yes, Darren. So, you spoke about how a woman 
read fiction and that fiction became for him a signal of transcendence. Mm -hmm. And that kind of created in him a, a vocational self-understanding that he wanted to write fiction to mm -hmm. lead people to God. Yeah. Could, you, could you say, as someone who's worked in theology and literature, yeah. can you say a little bit about how or what recent fiction has served for you as a signal of transcendence? Contemporary, so not, not 20th century. Um, so some of my favorite contemporary works right now, uh, Chris Beha's The Index of Self-Destructive Acts is one of the best novels I've read in a really long time. Um, and that was a National Book Award nominee last year or the year before. Uh, so that's a, that's a beautiful novel. Um, I'm trying to think of some other recent ones. Virgil Wander by Leif Inger is a great pointer to these things and these, these ways of being and the ways of seeing enchantment in the world. Um, 2010, is that contemporary enough? Because Mink River is just, Brian Doyle, his novel, I'll give you, a, I just, so I just read Mink River like a couple weeks ago on a plane, and it was one of those flights where everything went wrong, like everything went wrong, and so people were getting mad, you know, like a guy was standing up to the steward and was saying things like, this is unacceptable, doesn't American Airlines have to answer to anyone? It was like getting so angry, and I was sitting here reading Mink River being like, life is so wonderful. <laughs> Things are glorious. Like, I was just so overflowing with joy and gratitude after reading that novel. They're like, that guy didn't even phase me. I was just like, this is Leslie. I felt like I just ate joy. It was just, it was wonderful. Um, so Mink River, I think, is one of those novels for me recently. But I do read a lot of contemporary fiction, and I was talking the other night about a novel that was dark. I think there's also a place for the dark. Uh, some of these novels that are more joyful or comedic are wonderful, but there's also great novels that accidentally point to Christ because of the caution or the via negativa, and that's happening in contemporary fiction too. So there's, I definitely think there's a place for that. I mean, Walker Percy is like 200 pages of via negativa and then like 50 pages on the little way. <laughs> yes? So um, would you like to comment at all on the, um, the namesake of Thomas More and his relationship to the character Thomas More? Yeah, yeah, you know, um, Tom Moore, Dr. Tom Moore, the psychiatrist, is always lamenting that he's not Sir Thomas Moore, right? He says, um, I wish I could be like my namesake, who loved everyone and was loved by everyone. He even talks about how when Thomas Moore went to um, the scaffold, was making the executioner laugh. And Dr. Tom Moore is like, I want to be that, and yet I just don't like people. You know, so, so he struggles with the fact that he just doesn't like people, but he wants to love people and be loved. Um, and, and so I think, I think we're supposed to constantly be reading in this in comparison, because one of the great things that St. Therese shows us is how to love people. So at one point in Story of the Soul, St. Therese talks about um, a nun came to her and is like, why, are, why do I make you smile every time that you see me? And she writes in her journal, so no one else sees this till she's gone, I really detested that other nun. <laughs> so what I would do is every time I saw her, I would smile at her, and I would try to find a way to love her like my favorite person in the world. And so she would do everything she could for her favorite person to the person she liked the least. Right? This practice of overcoming your dislike of others is just something we don't think of. And yet that's such a, those are small, holy acts that don't occur to Tom Moore really until um, what happens in the novels, he actually descends almost into hell. And there's this irony that the place he lives is called Paradise Estates, but it becomes an infernal world in which he's like possessed by a devil. It's a super fun novel. I bet you're all gonna pick it up now because it's really great. Um, but he, at the very end, when he's so close to being completely taken over and possessed, he prays to Sir Tom Moore and says, Again, earmuffs, Percy uses language. He's like, drive this son of a bitch hence. You know, he's talking about the devil. Like, get him out of here. I don't want to be possessed. And that's like the strongest prayer he ever prays is this renunciation of the devil um, that happens because of Sir Tom Moore in his life. So, of course, as, as Percy, you know, the interaction of the saints, the intercession of the saints in his actual salvation. Yeah. I've only read the movie, but yes. I'm curious how do we prevent the little That is a fantastic question. Oh, that's a really good question. I had not thought of that. Yes, I'll repeat it because that's a great question. So in the moviegoer, 
Binks bowling is perturbed by the everydayness, right? So it's the ordinary becomes so boring and blasé that you're like, what am I doing with my life? Nothing seems to have any meaning. So how does the little, di little, day, uh, little way not basically, uh, what did, word did you use? Slip into. Slip into the everyday, which is a great question. Um, man, but by the grace of God, you know, I'm thinking through the proactiveness of the little way, thinking through, so for St. Therese, it meant like accepting more blame for things that she didn't do wrong and receiving less credit for things that she did right in her community, proactively loving the people that bothered her. So it wasn't an everydayness in which you were just going through the motions. There was a proactiveness. And, and like uh, von Balthasar said, it was a proactiveness that was rooted in her contemplative life. Right? She drew on the source of action from a life of prayer and scripture reading. Um, I, think, I think that's the way, and you know what, I think that's actually what Bing Bowling finds at the very end, because the end for the moviegoer, he looks the same as he did earlier, but now he lives with a volitional, um, contemplative mindset towards what he's been doing, and everything becomes more meaningful. Everything has a purpose once you believe in the Incarnation. Yes. My question is, how do we, when, you know, we grow up a little way, yeah. and we're confronted with a uh, disappointment, mm -hmm. and how, and, you know, our openness is rebuffed, and how do we guard against shrinking in, shrinking in on cynicism, and I feel like cynicism is so fashionable now, yeah. and how do we continue to, you know, be disappointed by a person, and continue to hope all things So sin, I will say this, so C.S. Lewis used to talk about this, there are certain sins that have no, I have no proclivity towards, so I have no proclivity towards cynicism. Um, so that's, you know, that's harder for me. To, I find all things laughable, but I don't, it is, I'm not cynical. Um, I'm usually perpetually optimistic about things turning out well. <laughs> and uh, so when I think about those who are turning cynically inward, I think what usually happens is the wrong kind of community or the wrong kind of others pursuing the little way. Like if you don't have a community, St. Therese didn't do this by herself. Right? She was with her sisters. She was with others. Um, she was in a place of constant love. Whereas you look at Tom Moore, he was alone. He was isolated. He was alienated. He was cynical. He's by himself, making him a god of his own world. And um, you know, Chesterton talks about you need someone to break that small cosmos to bits. You need to break out of that prison of yourself that you were so easily creating. So I think the cynicism happens with a, a certain um, fashionable narcissism that we are experiencing and promoting in the way that um, you know, certain technology, certain habits of learning, certain ways of being in the world that are leading us to be silos, each one, right, to ourselves. So the more that we can break out of that silo mentality and recognize not just our belonging, but our interdependence, right? Um, I'm not trying to just get my soul to heaven. If I only got myself to heaven, what would heaven be, <laughs> right? If instead I imagine that the person's around me, uh, there's a prayer of humility in which you pray, um, Lord, increase, uh, or may others increase in holiness as long as I become as holy as I'm meant to be, right? So there's this idea of like, I want others to increase in holiness. I'm not just thinking about myself when I imagine what the pursuit of the holy looks like. So I, th I think that kind of mentality is necessary to break out of that despair. Yeah? Well, I was thinking the same thing with the question about how do you keep the little way from being every day yeah. in this community? Because if you are if you are being drawn into ennui and boredom mm -hmm. and repetition, add another person. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. And it will, yeah. It, it, it will do all kinds of things. Yeah. Absolutely. Not the everyday where persons are like props or objects right. that are in the day, but yeah. they are agents and people and you are in community with them and relationship with them. Yeah, one of the things that happens, so Percy always said he wrote one story seven times. 
So you'll find this kind of uh, repetition in, in his novels. But what he regularly writes about are these men who dehumanize women through most of the novel, in which women are used for the enjoyment of the guy who's the main hero of the text. And then everything converts, and the men get married. But this marriage is a sacramental move in which you no longer think of the woman as a thing, right? You instead are ready to die to yourself for this other person. And that transition into the sacrament of marriage usually leads that character to a more sacramental life in other ways. So when Percy is moving his work that direction, he's trying to get out of that use others as props mentality that really bother most of his characters. Right. And that was actually when, um, when Percy converted to Christianity, like when he made the decision, he made two decisions at one time. I'm going to enter the church and I have to marry Bunt. Like he had to marry this woman because of those things, it was acting on his faith to perform that sacrament. And he needed both, he knew, to continue being a Christian. Yeah. I, I, you're a joy. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, my question is kind of the opposite of Things slipping into the everyday, yeah. and I think I, I know the answer conceptually, but I just love to hear you talk more about surrender because I feel like I, there's also a pitfall on the other side where it's like you you can drop simplicity or you can like drop the complexity for simplicity, but your heart's not any different, and so like like you you actually like you're still really working hard in your flesh to to like be nice to everyone. Oh, yeah. And so how did, are there any other instances? It sounds like, like the, the marriage thing is like an instance of, are there any other instances in the book where he, his heart is actually transformed as well as, like, as he lives in simplicity? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think part, of, well, it's supposed to start with the slave quarters, like changing his residence like moving from this place, this position of power in the paradise of the states to the slave quarters, right? Accepting kind of more of the ascetic life, like getting out of some of the things that led to those other habits of being that he's trying to get away from. Uh, and of course, the marriage and the sacraments of the church. He definitely prioritizes the Eucharist as one of those sacraments. And I, I, the reason I'm thinking of it is also in connection to St. Therese. She believes that the Eucharist was the way that she continued to be able to live the little way. And I mean, I'm a Protestant, so the reality is bringing together the body and uh, the blood of Christ into your life, this understanding of like the incarnation, the body being us as the church as well as what you're partaking of. So again, it's that communal sense, um, but there's something to this meaningful partaking every single week, every, this regular um, pr pronunciation of your faith to the point of action, to the point of eating the body and the blood every single week. And I think that's why he ends in the Christian calendar. I think it is impossible to pursue the little way outside of this habitual church attendance in which church is forming you, the Eucharist is forming you, the prayers are forming you, right? Um, the rituals that make, I mean, who is it? Uh, Anne, Annie Dillard says, the way we live our hours is the way we live our lives. So if you don't have your hours constantly directed by the church and discipled, really, by the church calendar, by your Sunday routine, um, how is it that you're expecting to live this little way out? I don't think it's possible without those habits making up your life. Yeah, uh, yeah this is a great discussion. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I do wonder about how to sort of put together Percy's legendarily sort of curmudgeonly cranky uh, tech persona with something like the spirituality of the child mm -hmm. in a little way. And so I think you're persuading me that there might be a connection like, between the two. Uh, but uh, now, but my, my question is uh, I mean, Percy I mean, obviously becomes a deeply committed Catholic Christian, and I mean, everything you say about that is absolutely right. But what is it that enables him to discern that um, every day is, is a trap? Yeah. You know, this idea of one thing after another after another, you wake up, you consume some content, you go to sleep, you do the same mm -hmm. thing. It's all, I mean, what is it that actually gets um, Percy out of that and into the idea of something else? Right. A lot of it is a reading of a really bad person, namely a philosopher, Martin Heidegger, you know, who uh, joined the National Socialist Party. And it's all sorts of things not to his credit. Mm -hmm. But it's actually really Heidegger 
I mean, he, he was the cousin of every game as director from uh, being in time. And so a lot of the sort of diagnostic or critical work of the uh, sort of hollowness of modernity yeah. comes from his reading of people like Heidegger and others, and decidedly not people who are heroes of the Christian tradition. So I guess what I'm wondering is, does Percy have anything to teach us about how we can both read sort of these, you know, famous figures of the Christian tradition yeah. that we aspire to be like, and people who are perhaps the uh, Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think one of the, the key things to think about with Percy is he's formed intellectually and imaginatively. So he's having his heart formed in a certain way, and he's having his mind formed in a certain way, and those things aren't divided from one another in the process. So someone like Dostoevsky is forming how he imagines the world, and therefore the, the intellectual analysis of Heidegger, how does that fit within the story I want to live by? If it, right? Does that make sense? So yeah, so he's putting those pieces together. It's not, um, it's not divided for him, right? So he is constantly imagining the philosophy is not by itself. So, so here's an example. Um, Ivan Karamazov, right, has his whole litany against God. It's all the protests, it's the arguments, and Dostoevsky says, you can't fight those arguments. Now, how is he going to fight those arguments? Well, what he does is he writes the bro Brothers Karamazov that actually fights the arguments within it. Or you look at the life of Father Zosima, which was supposed to be his refutation to the arguments. I think for Percy, he very much follows that model. Here are the arguments, but what is the life that I want to live? And so he can embody, he can embody the arguments because he's trying to think about what story he wants to live by. Not the philosophy separate from the story for him. They go together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Besides the camel privilege, with one last question here. When Baylor University takes people like me and sends us away to dean training school, they make us memorize the mission of the university. Does anybody in the room know it? Maybe. The uh, mission of Baylor University is to educate men and women for worldwide leadership <laughs> and service by integrating academic excellence mm -hmm. and Christian commitment within a caring so the it's question like, yeah. is, how might we think about that mission mm -hmm. through the lens of the little way of the apocalypse when the models for worldwide yes. leadership yeah. Yeah. are governors of Texas or United States representatives or corporate CEOs mm -hmm. uh, or filmmakers or fill in the blank? Right. So what, what does a little way of the apocalypse have to say to us who want to embrace and honor mm -hmm. and fulfill this mission? Absolutely. Well, so Walker Percy pursues the little way by writing a giant novel that gets nominated for a National Book Award. <laughs> right? You see the irony in that. Um, but I think that this is where what I was talking about earlier with magnanimity comes in. Because each of us are called vocationally to different things in different places. We need a Joan of Arc, but we also need St. Therese. And both of them are aspiring not to be the public figures. I mean, yes, that's what St. Therese originally wanted, but she submitted that to what does God want for me. So her way is open to all, but that does not mean that following the little way of St. Therese is not going to put some people into the general seat like St. Joan of Arc or Martin Luther King Jr. It's not, he's practicing a little way in his daily life. It doesn't mean that he's not going to be called to a stage. Right? So I think you have to practice the little way not to pursue the stage. And then if you end up there, you have to do with it what God would want you to do with it. There's a place of surrender and spiritual childhood in that moment. And the minute you start actually just liking the stage for the stage, you should get off the stage. Right? So I think that's the, kind of the answer to what it would mean to be a worldwide leader, is to not to want to be one, but accept it if it has to come. Join me, thank you.